right, hey, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us today. I'm gonna do something today. I don't, I don't know if I've done this in a message like this before, but today I'm going to read what we call the Christmas story. And, and, and here's the reason, because we don't want Christmas to get by without at least allowing us to, to, to reflect on that, to hear that. It gets busy, we get gone, the lights, the presents, the parties, uh, may, maybe this year the, the, the being at home and being away and dreading and whatever it may be, but, but, but I don't want the time to slip by without us taking a moment to, to, to stop and to look at the Christmas story. So we're gonna do that this morning. Just before we get in to that, I wanna remind you of a couple of things. So if you've been with us since the beginning, this will be your third reminder, but we really have some great things this week, and man, we would love for you to, to join us in whatever part of that that you can join us in. This Wednesday, Christmas Eve Eve, we're doing something we've never done before. We're going to do a Christmas Eve Eve service, a lot of fun, carols, singing, uh, devotion. We're going to focus in and worship our Lord and Savior, the reason why we celebrate at Christmas. We're going to have a candlelight moment. It's the 23rd, Christmas Eve Eve, and it is, as you've heard, in the Crest Pack parking lot, which if, you're, if you know where our campus is in Tucker, then beside us, there's an elementary school, and right beside that, there's a giant parking lot. The reason we're doing it there is, one, so we can do it outside, two, so that you can spread out. And somebody said, well, what if it's cold? I said, well, bring a coat, right? It's Christmas. It'll be okay. Bring a mask, bring a chair, come and let's have fun. That'll be six o'clock, one hour from six to seven. And we're just going to enjoy that moment together. Then Christmas Eve, our production team, worship team has been working on just uh, what's going to be a wonderful special that I, I'm, I'm praying will bless you that you will enjoy it. Uh, it will air at 3, 5, and 7 on Christmas Eve, and then after that, it'll be on demand. Uh, you can find it on our website. So gather your family and join us for that. Man, we would, we would love for you to be a part of that. Next Sunday, as Cheston said, we'll be online only. All right, so we, we, we wanna look at the Christmas story, the story of Jesus found in the Gospels in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the Christmas story that we, we, we typically, when we see it uh, in uh, manger scenes, when we see it, played out, um, all of that happens in Matthew and Luke. Right? Mark just kind of jumps in. He jumps in and says, this is the beginning of the good news of the Messiah, Jesus. I like, write to it. So, 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 so he gets right there. John actually begins in a little bit different way. Instead of so much of the what, as we talked about over the last couple of weeks, he gives us the why of Christmas, the, the, the why behind all of this. And what's really interesting is John probably could have told the story maybe better than anybody else. If, if you know, and we talked about, if you know what happened, Jesus is at the cross, uh, Jesus is on the cross, and, and he puts John and Mary, he says, Mary, this is your son, John, this is your mother, and tradition has that John took care of Mary for the rest of her life. So, so John could have asked all kinds of questions, could have heard the story over and over, and tell me about that, and tell me about the, the angel, and tell me what he said, and tell me about the trip, and all of that. And yet when John begins his gospel, he doesn't begin with Bethlehem, he doesn't begin with the star or the announcement. John tells us why Jesus came. As a matter of fact, John begins his gospel like this. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. It's like, it's like, like John starting out, John saying, I want you to know God showed up. Right, he stepped into our world. Jesus came, put on the, the, the flesh and blood, put on the humanness so that we could know what God is like, how much God loves us, so that he could be our savior, so that we could begin to understand and have a relationship. I mean, he jumps right into the why of Christmas. Now, now John, as we talked about, he's old when he writes this. He's reflecting back on his life, walking with Jesus, listening to the stories, having been through all of that, watching uh, as, as the culture he loved was destroyed, watching the temple be flattened, watching Rome take over, watching his friends die, all of this world turned upside down. He's, he's just kind of looking back over this as he writes the gospel. And, and, and maybe he's saying, listen, I, I, I wanna start with this in case you don't read the whole book, right? I wanna tell you the information right up front 
God came. He stepped into our world so we could know him, so he could transform us. And then he says things like this, and we've been talking about this over the last few weeks. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. We said it goes on to say, right, and, and, and the darkness, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. In other words, John's like, God gave you a gift at Christmas. The light came into the world to bring light into your life, to transform you from the inside out. The, the thing that makes John to me so interesting is John goes not just with the why, but John gets really personal about Jesus. He, he, he talks a lot about this relationship that we can have. As, as a matter of fact, he says this in chapter 1, verse 12. Yet to all who did receive him. Now, 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 now we believe the Spirit, the Holy Spirit's leading John. John's writing under inspiration. So, so I don't know how it worked. I don't know if he just sat down and boom, it all flowed. Or, or if he kind of thought through words. But, but go with me. If he's thinking through these words. So he writes this to all who receive, did receive him. And, and you know what? You know what it is to receive a guest. You know, you open the door, you welcome them in, and, and yet maybe he's thinking, I don't know. You know, what is that? What, what, what does that mean? And how are people going to understand? And then we receive a baby, or do we receive Jesus as an adult? And, and so maybe he's wrestling with the words, and he goes, I got to find a way that people understand. It was more than just going like, Hey, Jesus, come on in. You know, we're receiving you as a guest in our house. And so he goes on to write something that. That as far as I could find and from reading about it, he puts together two words that had never been put together in all of Greek literature before this moment. He says, to those who, and here's these two words, to those who believed in, to, to those who believed in his name, and, and, and he takes these two words that have never been put together, and it's like John makes up a phrase. Right? You, you ever come across you know, people that use a word in a, in, in a different way, or it's, it, it's, it's a slang, or it's used in some way that, oh, that word has never been used like that before, but it gets your attention? You go, oh, and, and maybe it gives a little bit more understanding, and you're like, oh, I never thought of it. That way I never understood. We, we, we've all experienced words like that and phrases like that. And, and so John puts this together. That when the reader would have read this, I thought, oh, I, I, I never heard it like that before. He, he takes this word believe. He takes this word for faith. And, and he adds a preposition in. And, and again, as far as I can tell, this has never been done before in Greek literature. And he puts them together and he says, to those who believe in his name. Now, now listen, it's more than to those that believe that. And, and, and it may be a, a weak illustration, but the only thing I could think of would be like, like a chair. Like you can believe that a chair will hold you if you sat down in it, right? You can see this chair and you go, yep, I believe that chair would hold me. I believe in that chair. However, there's a big difference when you go to sit in the chair, right? Then you believe in the chair. Does that make sense? Like, I, I can look at it and say, I believe that'll hold me. And, and yet, I got a chair at home. It's my favorite. It's a recliner that I don't even think about it when I get home. I mean, it's all my way to everything I am. And, you know, sometimes maybe I mean, jump off and, you know, land in it. Why? Because I believe in it. It carries this idea of I put my whole weight on it, I surrender all that I am. I, I, I trust in it so much that I cast my whole self. Upon that, and, and, and so John is saying this about Jesus, that to those that receive him, to those that believe in, that trust him, that, 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 that cast their whole selves, that surrender everything they are. It says, to those who receive him, to those who believed in, trust in, cast, them whole, cast their whole selves on, believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Something that transforms their lives. Something that, that, that changed everything about them. It's like John wants you to know this isn't just a story. This, this is personal. If you, if you want to know the why behind the what, if you want to know about the birth narrative and all that we read and, and, and make it more than just, wow, that sounds good and it's pretty and, 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 and I can visualize it and I see nativities in the picture. And John says, you, you got to know. It, it's more than just story. As a matter of fact, John even ends his gospel letting us know 
that, that this, this was more than just something historical written down. You got to understand the why behind it. John says this, but these are written, this whole gospel, all the stories, everything that he wrote down about Jesus, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, trusting him, casting your whole self on surrendering everything to, by believing you may have life in his name. Your, 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 your life may be transformed. John wanted you to know this is something that actually happened. This is history. This is God and the body and a body and the person, the purpose of it, the reason behind it is so that you could have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. It's true. God loves the whole world. But John wanted you know it's, it's more than just God loving the whole world. God loves every individual in the world. God loves you. God came to save the world, but God came to save you. It's where, where we get the whole concept of a personal relationship with Jesus. It's not based on somebody else's. It's not based on going to church and my family and we're Christians because of where I was born or because my parents are Christians. John, John is trying to make sure we understand. Jesus steps into this world so that we could have a personal relationship with our Lord and Savior. And John would write that Jesus dies for the sins of the world. But he didn't just die for the sins of the world. He dies for your sin, for my sin. So that individually, we could be forgiven. So that individually, we could find the truth. And individually, we could be free. And this is where we get the idea of the personal Savior. It's absolutely incredible how John begins to bring this out. Jesus comes into the world for the whole world. But Jesus comes into the world for every single person in the world. And, and, and here's what's cool. Listen, it took... Those guys that followed Jesus early, John would have been one of them, Matthew, Peter, James. It, it took them like three years to figure this out, right? The, the, the whole time, I mean, once they even realized he was the Messiah, if you read through the narrative, you even hear them asking questions and they're like, okay, we get it, you're the Messiah, but when are you gonna rise up? When are we gonna overthrow? When are we gonna take over? When are you gonna step into that, that kingly, priestly, Messiah-ish role and we're gonna conquer Rome and we're gonna overthrow everything? For three years, they kept waiting for him to do something he never planned to do. It took them three years to understand this about a man who came into the world to be the savior, not just of Israel, but to be the savior of the world. Here, here, here's what was going on for three years. They had the wrong agenda for Jesus. And the reason it's important for us is I think if we're not careful, we can go through life having the wrong agenda for Jesus. What he can do for us and what he wants to do for us. We want him to do things. We want him to, 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 to fix things. And we put him in so many different boxes. And John wants to make sure we don't miss the why behind the what. That Jesus didn't just come to overthrow. And he didn't just come to simply heal people. Jesus came into the world to save you from your sins. To be your savior. And I think if John was here, maybe, maybe he would ask us this question. Do you believe? Do, do you believe in? Have you trusted in? Not do you believe that. Not, 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 not have you looked at it and went, oh yeah, it's a good story. And I believe that Jesus is the son of God. And I believe that the Bible is true. Have you trusted in? Have you put your whole weight on? Have you surrendered everything? Receive forgiveness of your sins and surrendered your life to Jesus as your personal savior. And I, I I think if you haven't, if you're not sure, he would say, it's, it's okay. It took us like three years to get it, and we walked with the guy. We ate with the guy. We watched him do miracles. We watched Peter get out of the boat and walk on water, and we were like, yeah, Peter. And then we watched him sink, and we were like, oh, no, you know, what's going on? And, and all of these things going on. And it took us a while to realize Jesus came for so much more than just to overthrow the government. He came for so much more than to set Israel free. He came to set us free, to transform us from the inside out. 
So we, we finally got a hold of this. As much as we thought our problem was Rome, as much as we thought our problem was money, as much as we thought our problem was, was somebody else and him or her or this or that, it finally do, dawned on us that God sent exactly what we needed because our problem was sin. I, I don't know if you've ever read this. Max Lucado quotes this. I'm not sure where he got it from, but, but he says, if our greatest need had been information, God would have sent an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. But since our greatest need was forgiveness, God sent us a savior. I think John would say, don't kid yourself about the point of Christmas. Don't, don't kid yourself about the purpose of God sending his son into the world. He sent Jesus to transform your life from the inside out, to be your savior, to be your Lord. It's what we believe about Christmas. Now, now, let me read the Christmas story to you. I'm going to make some comments, and then we're going to come back. We'll wrap this up with John in just a few minutes. Okay, so we're going to start Matthew and Luke. We're going to combine them together. We're going to start in the book of Luke, all right? So here we go with what is traditionally called the Christmas story. Luke's gospel begins like this. Luke 1, verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Now you can imagine, angel shows up, she's scared. Mary was greatly troubled at his words, wondered what kind of greeting this might be, but the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. Now, now we read Jesus, it's a Latin translation. It would have sounded more like Yeshua to them, all right? And this will be important in a moment because when that was said to them, something inside of them probably leapt and it jumped because they knew there was a promise for one to come in, in, the, in the spirit of Joshua from the Old Testament, right? One, one, one to come who would be a deliverer. So when they hear this, it's like, oh, I think I'm getting a hold of what you're talking about. He will be great, and he will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end, all right? So then jumping over to Matthew. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she, had found, she was found to be pregnant with the Holy Spirit. Now you can imagine... It's a rough time right here in her life. Not married. Uh, this could have gotten her put to death, outcast, you know, all the things, all the promises. And now she is pregnant. Verse 19, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Now, now back then, this promise to be married was, was like a legal contract. It wasn't just like, you know, hey, yeah, you want to get married? Sure, maybe someday. I, I mean, this was, this was a big deal. And so Joseph, being a good guy, being full of grace, he decided, you know what, we'll do this the right way, but we'll do this quietly. Back then, he couldn't have sent her a text, you know, I'm out, you know, whatever. You know, hey, mail me my letter jacket back, and we're done, you know, we're breaking up. Now, this would have been something they would have done legally. It would have been public. Verse 20. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Can like you imagine? Even though I know what people are going to say, even though people are going to talk, even though they're going to assume that you guys didn't wait and all of that. But he, but he goes on. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. Now remember, what he would have heard was Yeshua. To which, now we don't know this, but maybe Joseph wakes up and goes, oh, man, the, the prophecy is going to be fulfilled in our family. I'm, I'm going to be part, Mary's going to be part of fulfilling what we have looked for all along, the coming of the Messiah. You will give birth, she will give birth to a son, you are to give his, him the name Jesus because he will save his people. And Joseph's probably like, yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. The Messiah's coming. The, 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 the one after Joshua will have the wisdom of Moses. He will have the, 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 the prowess and the deliverant power of, of Joshua. And he's gonna rise up and he's gonna overthrow Rome and he's gonna deliver his people. This is gonna be awesome. And I think the angel will probably like, hey, hang on a second. You know, let me finish. 
because he will save his people from their sins. And now can you imagine? Joseph's probably like, wait, wait, hold on. We already got a system for people to be saved from sin. It's called the temple. Right? It's been set up for generations. We go there, we sacrifice, it's all over. As a matter of fact, we don't need to be saved from our sins. We need to be saved from Rome. Rome needs to be saved from their sins. I mean, I think, I think we got all of that going on. And they see, this wasn't exactly what they were looking for. Everybody has their agenda for Jesus. And the angel steps in and he says, he will come as Joshua, as a spirit of Joshua, deliverer, the savior. But he's come to save people from the thing they need saving from the most, their sin. To, to change them on the inside. And not, not to overthrow governments, to overthrow that part of us that always wants to be captain of our life and leads us towards destruction. To give us something we can hold on to and believe in. Something where we could find life. Because you'll save people from their sins. Verse 22. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. And the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel. Which means God with us. When Joseph woke up he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. And took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. Alright let's switch back over to Luke, he picks back up, Mary, beginning to show. Everybody knows she's pregnant, right? And so now this is that part we often are familiar with, Luke chapter two. In those days, Caesar Augustus, Roman, Empire, Roman emperor, king, so to speak, of Rome, had never happened before now. He's the first one, full emperor, king of all of the land. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to be registered. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to, Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house of the line of David. Okay, think how cool this is. Mary and Joseph are in the wrong place. They're, they're, they're still at home, and yet the prophecy is Jesus will be born in Bethlehem. And so it's like 80, 90 miles away, which doesn't sound a lot like a lot much to us today, but they couldn't hop in their minivan, their SUV, scoot on over, get counted. This was, a, this was a long journey. Mary's very pregnant, right? We know that. As she shows up, it's not long until she has baby Jesus, so they have to travel. Get this. How cool is this? This wasn't even looking like it was in the cars. This is something that hadn't happened. And yet God, think of the sovereignty of God. God in the spirit nudges a pagan king, puts something on his heart to count everybody. How cool is that? And so he puts out this decree, and because of the decree, prophecy is fulfilled. I, I, I just love that because I think it reminds us how big our God is. When we, when we think things have slipped by and hadn't noticed, uh-uh, God can turn the hearts of anybody. God can turn the hearts of kings, people that don't even believe in them, to fulfill his will. I just, I just thought that was really interesting. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks by night, at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. Now, I was reading about this, and I thought this was pretty cool. I was like, why, why shepherds? Why did the angel appear to shepherds? And one writer was writing and said, because shepherds were considered outcasts. They, 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 were, they were considered unclean. They, they raised animals that were given for sacrifices, and yet they weren't allowed to enter. They, they didn't get to participate in most of the religious things. And can you imagine living your whole life, and that's what you did, and feeling like you were a little bit of an outsider, and you were too distant, and you wondered, is there hope for me? And I don't know, and is God, does God even care about me? An angel of the Lord appeared to them. The glory of the Lord shone round, round them, and they were terrified but the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, right here it is, it's a savior, you guys. He is gonna be born for you. You who thought you were beyond saving. 
You who thought God didn't care, you who thought you were an outcast and maybe forgotten, you're included in this because it's personal. It's for everybody. A Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem to see this thing that has, and here's a key word, because you gotta get hold of this. This is why this story, this account, this event is so important to us. Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Now, here's what you need to understand if you're not a Christian. We're not Christians because of the Bible. We, we, we love the Bible. We honor the Bible. We, 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 we trust the Bible. We follow the Bible. We're not, we're not Christians because of the Bible. We're Christians because something happened. And the Bible is a story of that happening and how we should live in light of that happening. We're not, we're, not, we're not followers of Jesus because of the Bible. We're followers of Jesus because something happened and it transformed us. And when we trusted it, when we believed in, when we cast our whole life on it, it changed everything. And get this, there's not a whole lot from that time period that's recorded unless you were like a king or a military leader. And, and yet the story of these basically back then nobodies written down by several different people, passed down through generations, people giving their life to make sure this story reaches us. Why? Because something happened. And it's because it happened that we are transformed. Verse 16, so they hurried off, found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what, he had, been, what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed. And what the shepherd, at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all of these things and pondered them in her heart. Right, can you imagine her holding on to these things? I wonder, oh, is this gonna be true? And is this real? And thank you, God, that you've confirmed it through there. But I have my reputation and what do people think? And I don't know, and I'm not sure. And so now she's the mother of Jesus raising him. As a kid, the things that we read about in the Bible, I'm sure there were, there, there, there were moments where she's thinking, could it be? And, and I don't know, and, but I'm holding on to these things. And 33 years later, she watches her firstborn son give his life for us on the cross. She watches him die. She watches him be put in a tomb. And she goes to that tomb and she finds the tomb empty and she's embraced by her resurrected son who I think at that moment she knew beyond the shadow of a doubt everything that angel told me 33 years ago was true. Jesus, not just the savior of the world, but Jesus, my savior, my king, he has come so that we could know God so that our lives could be transformed. And Matthew would do his best to write it down, and Luke would do his best, and that's what we read. And they've written down all these details, but it would be John. John who took care of Mary. John, John who gives us the why behind the what. Years later, as an old man sitting by himself, writing all of this down. And, and I don't know, maybe he's thinking, man, I, I, gotta, I gotta let people know. Will anybody read this? Will, 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 will any of this stick with them? Because I need to let them know that this happened and it changed our lives and it transformed us. It's more than just a story. And he gets to the part where he's summarizing the story of Jesus and he come up, comes up with a way to summarize it. Little did he know that what he's about to write would be memorized and spoken for generations. It'd be written in language he didn't even know existed, maybe didn't exist then, and nations that didn't even exist then it hadn't been discovered. And think about this, it had never been written before. But John, who saw it all, experienced it all, who heard the, 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 the words and the narrative from Mary dozens of times, it's like, how do I say this? And in God's amazing grace, he allowed John to say it best. John summarizes it like this. For God so loved the world, that he gave, that it happened at Christmas. Jesus stepped into our world. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever, whoever, anybody, everywhere, not, not, not just everybody, but each individual that you and you and you and me, that whoever, and here's that phrase, believes in, puts their whole life on, trusts and surrenders everything. Doesn't mean we'll always get it right. Doesn't mean we always understand it fully. Doesn't mean we're sure how it works. Doesn't mean we, we, we don't fail and fall. But whoever says, okay, God, I believe. Everything I am, I put my whole life on you. What Jesus has done for me. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. How, how cool is that? And here we are. Can you imagine John writing this down and going, eh, I hope someday somebody reads this. Here we are 2,000 years later. And most of us probably can quote it or get really close. Because the words live on in us. But listen, it didn't stop there. I, I don't know why as kids, and I don't know why we always teach, we memorize this one verse as beautiful as it is, but we stop. Because it's like we miss the exclamation on this whole thought John 3, 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That's what happened. That's the good news of Christmas. That's why we celebrate Christmas. God sent a savior not to condemn because he knew what we needed most. Saving from ourselves, forgiveness of sin, transformation, change, which means in spite of what you think you need, in spite of what you think you need this Christmas, God understood what we really needed, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Will you bow your heads with me? God, we so needed Christmas. Thank you. Thank you for what happened. It's not just stories. It was an event. It changed history. Changed our lives forever when we believe in, when we trust in. Thank you for sending your son. It's completely changed our lives. Lord, it's changed our lives in ways, God, we probably don't even know. Things that you saved us from, your grace and your mercy, and ways that you worked that we didn't even see, along with all of the ways that we've seen you at work. God, for some, maybe they wish they'd have heard it when they were younger. For some of us, maybe we wish we'd have followed a little more closely and trusted in you a little more. But here we are this Christmas season to say thank you. Thank you for sending exactly what we needed, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And Heavenly Father, if it's never been personal before, Lord, I pray, would you make it personal today? Lord, whoever may be joining us and they've never fully believed in, trusted in, may this be the Christmas season that their life has changed forever to believe in what happened, that you love them so much that Christmas happened. Jesus stepped into our world so we could know you. We could see what you were like, how much you love us, so that he could lead us back to a relationship with you. So that when he gave his life for us on the cross, paid the price for our sin so that we could be forgiven so that we could be free the greatest gift ever given so that when he rose from the dead three days later we could know we could trust you and so Lord those of us who believe in what happened and believe in you remind us how much you love us Lord, I pray at the end of this crazy, crazy year, would you remind us how close you are? Would you speak to our hearts over this next week? 
as we do whatever we do for Christmas, buying gifts, opening gifts, celebrating with our loved ones, talking to, to family and friends, whatever it is, to remind us how much you love us, how close you are. And for those who don't know you, may this be the Christmas they believe in, they trust in you as their Lord and Savior. And may their lives be changed forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, our worship team is going to come back and we're going to do what we do every week. We're just going to take a few moments and open our hearts to God. We're going to sing our worship. We're going to let him speak to us. So if you will, during this time, would you just open your heart and let God remind you how much he loves you if you've drifted away, may, may this be a time where you just come back home and say, God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for never giving up on me. And if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, would you hang around for just a few minutes more? Would you let him talk to your heart? Because he can say things in your heart that I could never say to you. Would you let him tell you how much he loves you? Those of you in the room, will you go ahead and stand with me? Those of you online, thank you. And let's, we're going to spend a few moments. We're going to worship our Lord and Savior together.